Okay, so right now we're going to talk about handling exceptions in Java as well as file input and output. They kind of go hand in hand. You can't have file input and output without exception handling. So let's get started. So um, an exception is a kind of runtime error uh, caused by you, either your code or user input. Like for example, I could be asking for a uh, whole number and you choose to input a letter of the alphabet, well, that's going to cause the program to crash. Um, or if maybe a file, a file isn't found, or if there's a division by zero, things like that. Uh, those are just major sources of error for most computer programs, and those common errors uh, should be handled somehow in your code. And I only cover, uh, this, this slideshow only just covers just the bare surface of uh, runtime errors and exceptions and exception handling, which students should be familiar with if they're going to run code that's, that'll actually do well. Well, uh, by now you've probably figured out that you can't do this. So here I declare public static void main. I divide by zero here. I got 30 divided by zero. Probably not a good plan, but if you wanted to get the program to crash deliberately, uh, you probably would do that. Um, and this is the error you would get. So um, exception in thread main and Java Lang arithmetic exception division by zero, blah, blah, blah. And the question becomes, how do we void? And once this happens, the program execution always stops. Uh, is there a way we can handle it in a more civil manner so that it quite possibly could go on, that it could invite the possibility that you could continue execution. Um, so what about it? Um, so let's say that we try something like this. So it's the same code all over again. And we have basically uh, 30 divided by 0. Obviously, it can't be done. And then, but it's in this new entity called try. We call that a try block. Now, obviously, 30 divided by 0 is going to do something which we call throwing an exception. And in this case, we're throwing an arithmetic exception. That division by 0 is simply not allowed. And the appropriate message under an object we declared called E will simply be input, output. Now, if you don't want, if you don't want to have that same um, error as as was here in red, you can have a more user friendly message by simply controlling yourself what message is given. So you can just say cannot divide by zero. Sorry, you know, and that immediately tells the programmer and the user uh, what the program had attempt had been attempting to do before it threw an exception. Um, so. Uh, this would be a more a little more user friendly. So, um, what if we had a string a? We declare a string a with just open and close quotes. That's a null string. So let's say that we access a dot char at zero. That means that we uh, now what is zero in a character array? Well, zero in a character array is the first character. Because remember that a, an array starts from zero. So this character array, which is a string, starts at zero. But the problem was we had no we had no characters in A in the first place. A was a null string, meaning that you had a quote and a close quote and nothing in between, meaning that there is no first character. So a dot char at zero is attempting to access a first character when really there isn't really a first character there, um, and so it throws an exception. Okay, and here in this try and catch, we we catch the exception, and with any good luck, keep the program running if we're able to do so. So. What if the string is non-empty? So if the string is non-empty, you have a word like cat, okay? It has characters C at position 0, character A at position 1, 
and the T character is at position 2. And look at the next line. We're doing A dot char at 4 and we can only count as high as 2. This is not going to end well either. So that try, that that access, uh, that attempt to access the fourth character in an array that only has three characters where two is the highest index, um, we'll throw an exception as well. And the same exception is in the last slide, a string index out of bounds exception. So what about here? We have, uh, what if a person is trying to input a number uh, that really isn't um, or or maybe you're reading a number that isn't expected like for example uh, let's say I'm trying to read an integer and instead I get a floating point either that or I get a letter of the alphabet either way I'm gonna have a type clash and uh, there's the possibility that an exception will be thrown due to the type clash it's called an input mismatch exception where the data type of the actual data coming into the stream doesn't match the data type of the variable that it's supposed to be stored into. So uh, that's how an input mismatch exception gets thrown. So notice that in the try block we have system out print input a whole number and then i equals sc dot next int and then system out print line i. Okay, so all of this having to do with inputting a whole number, making the assignment from the scanner to the variable i and then printing it, all of that would be in the try block, okay? If we took, basically, uh, and the reason they're all in the try block, they all have to do with the scanner and the use of the variable i, right? Uh, they all go in the try block because obviously if, if an exception is already thrown when next int is read and assigned, then system up print line won't execute either because <laughs> it has a it it has bad data to go on. So um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, Java util scanner. Uh, here we have we're finally doing a file read, and the idea is here we have fh equals new scanner, but instead of system dot in we have new file data dot dot. Now new file data dot dot. Well, data dot that could be any file. You could have called it data dot text or Fred dot ABC, whatever. I mean, your your mileage may vary, but call it something sensible. And uh, data dot that has to be somewhere where Java can find it. If it can't find it, it's a very common error. If it can't find it, then it'll throw a file not found exception, which hopefully you're able to handle. Okay, now. If you want to eliminate these file not found exceptions happening in reality, make sure your data dot dat or your data file, whatever you choose to name your file, is in the same directory as your source code. In Replit, you simply have to upload it through the, the uh, upload tool, right? Uh, so that basically is how that's done. In fact, if I, I don't know if I can do this here, go into replit let's just go here and wait for this to refresh uh, I have main.java here and I want to see if I can gr upload a file called ledger.dat so I have a file down here dot ledger.dat could have been data.dat but ledger.dat is that data file that you saw um, and I'll, I'll open it and it should be read up here I guess it's not read hold on Let's see if it's actually there. Okay, I don't know why ledger.dat is not read, so let's try that again. Upload file. Drag and drop files to upload. Okay, that's a pro tip. Oh boy. So what if I what if I do this? So there we go. That works. Um so let's um Okay, so now if we do a list, a file listing, we should have ledger.dat and if we look at its contents we can see that it contains just plain old text. We call it unformatted text or uh, ASCII 
f we call it a flat ASCII file, which means that it, unlike a Word document, it doesn't have any special formatting characters in it. It's the kind of file that you would edit in Notepad. And if you want to call it ledger.txt so that you can read it in Notepad if you want, go ahead and do it. Let's go back to uh, handling exceptions. So uh, let's go back here. And um, all right. So, all right, so we're reading from a file. Notice that we're skipping a whole bunch of code up here where we say inside main. We're skipping some code and we say reading from a file. We're reading our file. And of course, if that file is not found, if that file is not in the same directory as your source code, uh, a, a, uh, an exception will be thrown, file not found. So uh, hopefully you have a try catch construct that does that. Well, the thing about Java is that it expects to see that if that's what you're doing. All right, so the second part of this presentation, uh, that is file IO in Java. And uh, let's see, let's see what we can do here. Now, um, the idea is that we want to open up a file for reading. Uh, this source here just opens it up in the old-fashioned way so that you can take input from a keyboard. That input is called standard input. Standard input is just input from a keyboard as opposed to input from a file or input from a scanning device or input from, you know, some gizmo. But you know, usually, usually we're, you know, traditionally when we're starting off a computer science course we just talk about input from data files either that or input from a keyboard so um, I'm not too interested in this except I want to draw your attention to some of the key features of what we had been doing all semester in terms of reading file from uh, a keyboard is that we would set up a scanner uh, passing system.in into the scanner when it's instantiated and then uh, we declare an integer to, or we declare a variable to get the next value uh, that it sees. So, you know, if, if it's an integer, then you use next int. If it's a double, you use next double. If it's a string, you just use next. You don't use anything special. Well, that's what we had, right? We're still going to use that, and we're still going to use scanner for file I.O. So this is all there as a reminder. Also, it's a good habit to close your files that you open. Now, you know, this is what we're closing right now. So we opened a file called standard input, which is this thing, the keyboard, right? Okay, uh, we opened that up for reading, and uh, um, it's a good habit to close it, although a little counterintuitive to close a keyboard, isn't it? When you think closing a keyboard, what would that do? It doesn't do anything, actually. But the thing is, um, the more serious part of this close statement happens when you actually have files that you have to read from. Okay, When it's an actual file on your disk drive and you open that file for reading, you do want to close it when you're done. When you're done, you should close the file. Otherwise, you invite the possibility of file corruption. All right, you don't want that to happen. Okay, um, so please close your files that you open. Okay, well, okay, so now let's talk about opening a file for reading for sure. Now, the, these are actual. This would be an actual file that's on your hard drive, and that's called data dot dat. A very generic name for a data file. Um, so we have we import java.util.scanner, we import java.io. Um, basically, we want our scanner. We also want the IO for uh, input output. And um, so we skip once again. We skip a bunch of code here, and uh, we um, go into system out print line reading from a file. We set our scanner to null just to instantiate it, and then. We uh, give it um, we give it an actual scanner to use, which is really uh, a file name, and basically it's opening that file and pretending it's a keyboard, or pretending that it's input from a keyboard. It's the same data. It's the same to FH. It's all the same. So FH we could 
The reason I gave uh, the name FH to the variable or to the object, the scanner object, is because I'm used to, in other languages, in other computer languages, I'm used to talking about file handles. Uh, and when you open a file, you assign that open file to a file handle, which is kind of what this is, except it's really a, a glorified scanner object. And I can still do next int with it, and I can still check to see if my sentinel value is true, if I've really reached the end of the file. But in uh, Java, there's a better way to do that. You don't need a sentinel value of minus one at the end of your data to know that you've reached the end of your data. Uh, there's better ways of uh, better ways to do this. But as you can see, um, the main exception to trap here is whether data dot dot is actually where you think it is <laughs> okay and if it's not where you think it is you had better darn well find it and make sure that it is where you think it is or that it is with your the rest of your code um, so uh, there's much talk about uh, this list of numbers um, the, these are the data that's being read and it ends in a minus one the minus one is different from all the rest of the data and if and that can be used by the programmer as a signal that we've reached the end of the data it doesn't have to be that way in fact uh, you don't need a sentinel value you do need it in some languages but in in an increasing number of languages this is no longer the case it definitely wouldn't be the case in uh, uh, well, it, it could be the case in C and C++, but I think they even those languages um, can have a, a look ahead feature where it knows where it knows whether it's at the end of file or not. Okay, so let's go to the now opening a file for reading. We can do it two ways. Notice that uh, we can choose to declare the scanner in two statements or combine those two statements into one. That's kind of the main takeaway of this slide. Um, but in all instances, we close anything we open, right? We close what we open. Good habit to do, even if it's keyboard input. It's just a good habit. Um, okay, so I'm just going to skip this. Um, all right, so... Uh, you could... Well, I, I'm not going to go into this because really I think what we're all we're all going to do is probably something like, hmm, hold on a minute. There it is. Okay, I found it. Um, the reason I'm skipping all of this is because I think really at the heart of this is really we declare a scanner, but notice instead of having a do loop, we have a while loop which means that the exit condition of the while loop is declared at the top, which means that if the file is empty, don't even bother doing a statement inside the loop. Um, but if it's not empty, just keep going. While we have a next integer, we just keep going. And it'll detect when there's no more, no more data to read, no more integers to read. And uh, so that means that you don't need a sentinel value for this, right? If it already knows whether it's at the end of file or not, you don't need a sentinel value. You just let Java tell you when it's at the end of the file, which is really more of the standard way that things are done. And I think that's it. That's, um, well, there's another thing too. Yeah, there is there is one other thing. Uh, you can't have, um, you know, uh, another really important point is that File reads and arrays go hand in hand. Every example you saw on every other slide so far in this series of slides for file I.O., this kind of grayish black, charcoal black uh, set of slides, um, started with, started with uh, this, this variable I read all and read all the values into the same variable which meant that any previous value that was read is forgotten about. But, you know, if you have a long list of data, 
there's so much more you can do than treat them as individual numbers, right? Because that's kind of what we were doing up until we got to this slide. And um, why not read all of them into an array? Because that way you can do searching, you could do sorting, you can find the average, you can do all kinds of you can do all kinds of statistics on it. And you know that that would be a lot more powerful than simply just having a single variable that does all the that does all the work and doesn't really it isn't you know you sort of lose on flexibility as well. So the only drawback to using arrays in Java is that you have to know your data size, okay? So your data file, our data file, the, the one we have, has these eight numbers over here, right? They have these eight numbers, so I have to declare an array of size eight, okay? That's what I need to do, and that's something that uh, might irk some people, especially if you know another language, uh, because how come you can't... Basically, Java has not a really good ability to dynamically declare arrays. So we just have to declare them outright and then just uh, go with that. Just treat it as the be-all and end-all. Um, and there we go. So, um, And this is just basically a trace of the code if you want to read that in detail. This is another practice problem. Notice that we've kind of skimmed by three practice problems if you want to do these. This one is like the least doable because um, it does say um, that why not go through those numbers that are in the examples and sort the numbers or find the average or something. I haven't taught you how to sort. Uh, I haven't taught you how to do sorting of, uh, of arrays. Uh, I don't know if that is something that you would like for me to teach you. Uh, because they're between now and the end of the semester, there's easily enough time to do it. I might throw it in. Um, and anyone who hasn't yet done, uh, basically anyone who hasn't yet done the um, the 2.0 assignment yet, um, see the more of this stuff that is now part of the course, the more of that stuff that probably you, you can feel better about implementing. Although sorting and searching are not things that would be 2.0-ish, you know, because what I was aiming for was the same functionality, the same input and output, but just improved code. That, that's what I was going for. So sorting and searching, might, searching and sorting might be uh, something that we, we might have to do separately if there's a, a mini assignment for that or something like that. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be averse to that. I don't know how you guys feel. Anyway, so that is uh, that is my uh, spiel on um, error handling and file input and output. Have a nice rest of. The